Good afternoon, um, everybody. And um, my name is Michael Collins. I'm the Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to this webinar uh, this afternoon, which is co-organized by ourselves at the IIEA and the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Ireland. Uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe is, a, of course, a momentous continent-wide exercise in citizens' engagement on behalf of the European Parliament, the Council, the Commission, and member states, which aims to open a new space for citizens' dialogue and participation on the future of the EU, as well as on the key policy questions facing our Union. Before we begin and I introduce our panelists, let me briefly run through today's running order. Uh, I will first introduce each of our panelists before we move on to Mr. Giver Hofstadt uh, and his address, which will be followed by a brief Q&A with him before he has to leave us at 1.45. We will then move on to our panel discussion for their observation and thoughts, uh, followed by Q&A with them. I would ask you please to submit your questions in writing via Zoom's Q&A function uh, throughout the session as these questions occur to you, and we will come to as many as we can in the time available. With that, let me briefly introduce today's speakers. We have on the panel, we have Deirdre Clune, who is an MEP, of course, uh, Senator Alice Mary Higgins of Shannon Aaron, and Professor Jane Souter of DCU, and as a speaker before the panel, Mr. Guy Verhofstadt, MEP. Mr. Verhofstadt, as you may know, is the co-chair of the Conference on the Future of Europe, representing the European Parliament. And he's been, of course, an MEP and very well known to many of us since 2009, serving on the Committee on Constitutional Affairs and was chair of the European Parliament Brexit Steering Group and a former president of the Liberal ALDE Group. Before joining the European Parliament, he was, of course, President, Prime Minister of Belgium uh, between 1999 and 2008, and has also served as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of the Budget in Belgium. A reminder that today's address, Mr. Hofstadt's address, the discussions, both the panel discussion and our discussion with him, and the Q&A are all on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion uh, on Twitter using the handle at IIEA or the panel, the ha handle at e e EP in Ireland, that's European Parliament in Ireland, at EP in Ireland. We're also live streaming today's discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us through that medium, through the medium of YouTube. As I said, we will first hear from Mr. Verhofstadt before he must take his leave of us in about three quarters of an hour, and then we will go to the panel discussion. But for now, Mr. Verhofstadt, you're very, very welcome to Dublin virtually. The floor is yours. Just unmute there. Unmute. Hey, uh, unmute me. I hope that you hear me now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it's a pity that uh, we cannot organize this in Dublin itself, naturally, uh, because of the uh, uh, COVID uh, situation in, 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 in Europe, uh, uh, because uh, this uh, uh, conversation was in fact uh, uh, organized as a as a, uh, a start, uh, an introduction uh, towards a, a very important citizens panel uh, that would have taken place uh, this weekend uh, in Dublin, and uh, unfortunately, uh, together with the uh, Irish authorities, uh, we decided um, uh, to postpone uh, the uh, uh, citizens panel uh, that was foreseen for Dublin. Uh, to a later date. Uh, it will happen now in the first weekend of, uh, of February. Uh, uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be here in this, uh, 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 in this debate, in this conversation, uh, and want to explain, in fact, uh, what we as European Parliament ex expect from this uh, conference and, and, and why uh, we were, uh, uh, together with the Council and the Commission, uh, we organize uh, it. Uh, the aim to organize a conference on the future of Europe uh, and the request to have this conference is a, uh, a request that was already formulated years ago by, by the European Parliament, uh, because uh, in, in, in our point of view, uh, the new world order that is emerging uh, needs uh, uh, a European Union uh, that is different from the European Union 
uh, we uh, know uh, today. This new world order, we all know it, will be dominated by uh, superpowers like China, like uh, the US, uh, maybe India and, and others like uh, Russia. And in such a world order, uh, yeah, uh, it's not longer national sovereignty that can uh, defend our uh, interests uh, and our lifestyle, but we will need uh, uh, yeah, a, a shared a sovereignty on the European level uh, to defend our interests, our values. Uh, and our uh, way of life. Uh, and uh, the European Parliament is already a majority in the European Parliament, uh, a huge majority in the European Parliament is already uh, for a number of years uh, of the opinion that therefore uh, it's absolutely key to prepare a number of uh, reforms uh, in uh, the European Union. And the fact that Brexit happened, so I will not talk a lot of Brexit, the uh, 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 of this of this uh, sad story, but the fact that Brexit uh, happened uh, was uh, an, an additional uh, argument uh, to to organize it. If a big country like the UK is leaving the European Union, it's very difficult to say, "Oh, fantastic! It goes very good, very well with the European Union." There is a big member state leaving it, uh, the European Union. So, in 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 one way or another, the exit of of the UK is uh, a proof. Uh, yeah, of, of, of the fact that uh, there is a fundamental problem or there are fundamental uh, problems uh, in the Union and there is a, a need for reform. Uh, so I don't like Brexit, but Brexit was a wake up call, certainly, uh, for uh, a lot of people uh, to, to give up their resistance uh, against this conference for the future of, uh, of Europe, because there was resistance. And, and, and maybe there is still uh, a resistance. There are many people who are saying, yeah, but we did the convention uh, so many years ago. Uh, and I remember me it very well because I was in the chair of the, of the European Council when we launched the process with the Declaration of Laak and we launched the convention. And yeah, that uh, out of this convention came then the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, and uh, that uh, we, we faced a, a lot of difficulties to, to prove all this. So why now starting again? Uh, uh, such uh, an, an exercise uh, with this conference. Well, as I explained, the reason is that uh, uh, on the on the level of the institutions, for the first time, the three institutions will organize uh, are organizing this conference. That's the, the first novelty of this conference. So the convention, you remember that that was an initiative of the European Council, to which other institutions and other people were invited. Uh, so parliament was invited, national parliaments were invited. This time it's different. This is a common exercise of the three institutions. What is not uh, a given, what is not easy, uh, because uh, 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 therefore we have three co-chairs, everything has to be prepared by the three institutions be, uh, uh, before uh, we could launch uh, the conference. Uh, but it has the advantage, uh, uh, the fact that the three institutions are involved, that it will be difficult later on to say, oh, uh, the conference uh, have this and that conclusions. That's, that's, that's not our stuff. We were not involved in, in this. Uh, no, it's a, it's a common exercise of the three institutions to which, on an equal footing, uh, also uh, the national parliaments are, are involved through a, a, through a a, a, a real uh, important participation because there are 108 uh, uh, MEPs in the plenary, there are uh, 56 representatives of the member states of the council in the plenary, there is the commission in the plenary, but there are also uh, uh, for 108 representatives of the national parliaments because we believe that reforming uh, the union can only be done in a common exercise. Uh, between European uh, level and uh, the level of national uh, democracies. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense to talk about the future of the European Union uh, in, in, uh, uh, when we don't do it together. So that, that are the four components. And conclusions of the conference will need the consensus of these four components. Council, representing the member states, uh, commission, the uh, European Parliament, and the national uh, parliaments who have organized themselves through the normal uh, channel that we know, the Cossack uh, uh, format, uh, uh, what they are using to express their opinions and to participate in the conference. And the second big novelty is 
uh, as you already uh, indicated, uh, is naturally this uh, uh, participation, active participation of citizens, citizens in total 800 that have been randomly selected uh, with an over-representation of young people. And that's also for a good reason, because yeah, young people in, in, in our population represent one third of the population. So we thought, OK, then we need to give to uh, uh, the young people there, the 16 to 25, also one third of the seats, because they are speaking for uh, the young part of the of the population. So therefore, this over-representation of uh, 16 to 25 uh, youngsters uh, in uh, the conference. And these 800, uh, people will, will uh, define, and that is, uh, we are in the middle of the process, uh, their recommendations, their proposals for the reform of the Union. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's an experience uh, on the European level. I know that in, in, in Ireland, uh, we were already, there were already similar uh, experiences. There is in France uh, the experience with, uh, on, on, on the climate agenda. But uh, this is for the first time on the European level, a pan-European transnational active participation of citizens, uh, not uh, uh, as a listening exercise, uh, because we are, are not only listening to the uh, uh, to the citizens. No, um, no, of course, to know what the citizens want, we we have the Eurobarometer, we have the surveys, all this we know. What is more important in this uh, conference is the active participation of citizens, not only in formulating their recommendations, but also in shaping uh, the uh, and formulating uh, the response to these recommendations, in formulating the proposals for reform. So it is uh, in a certain way, uh, for the first time, certainly on the European level, uh, a, a combination, I should say, of representative democracy with participatory democracy, what we want uh, to achieve. And the reason uh, for that uh, is not that we don't have any trust anymore in representative democracy, but we think that uh, in, in, in the future, uh, uh, the liberal democracy will only uh, have the chance to, to prosper and, and survive uh, if we add a, a participatory uh, element uh, into our democratic practices. Uh, and so um, uh, one of the ideas that we are looking for is, is already today to say that maybe it's necessary that this type of citizens conventions we organize and the active participation of the representatives of the citizens' panels into the decision-making process of the union, maybe that needs to become a permanent, uh, a permanent tool, a permanent uh, instrument, uh, as as uh, in 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 uh, in in, uh, in the near future. Uh, so, but uh, the, the the second big uh, uh, novelty of this conference is this. Uh, permanent involvement from day one until the last day of the conference of the representatives of the citizens and the citizens uh, panels. They will be there, they will be present in the room, uh, they will uh, give their opinion when when the uh, the, the representatives of, 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 the, of the European Parliament, National Parliament, Commission and Council will formulate uh, the conclusions uh, of uh, uh, the conference. Uh, and, and, and that is an uh, absolute uh, unique experience that we, we, we never did uh, on, the, uh, on, on the level of the, uh, uh, of the European uh, Union. So, uh, the, as, as you know, uh, the basis for the discussions in the citizens' panels uh, is, is not a white page, a white paper. There is a digital platform that has been launched. Four million, nearly four million visitors have already visited that digital platform uh, and uh, nearly uh, between 35,000 and 40,000 uh, citizens have opened their own account uh, on the digital platform to participate uh, in uh, the debate. So also an individual citizen uh, can add his its ideas, his ideas, his opinions, his uh, views uh, towards uh, the whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, process. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit too early now already to say, yeah, what will come out uh, of uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, citizens' panels first of all, and 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 the, and the conference plenary uh, uh, in the course of next 
uh, of next year. But what uh, we uh, expect uh, is that because of the active involvement uh, of citizens in the whole process uh, afterwards, uh, when it comes to implement the conclusions of the conference, uh, it, it will be uh, very difficult to neglect uh, the conclusions of the conference because I cannot, uh, I cannot see, uh, I, I don't see the possibility for, for example, member states to say, oh, look, uh, uh, our citizens asked for uh, for that, but we don't want to do it. So it's uh, it's it's uh, um, what we hope that this conference uh, will create is an additional uh, pressure uh, for reform. Uh, in the three institutions of uh, of uh, of the union in the commission in the european parliament uh, but certainly uh, also uh, in uh, the european uh, council and uh, the list of uh, items that uh, the uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, already formulated uh, by uh, the citizens in their panels is a long list huh? is a list going from institutional issues like uh, end of unanimity, uh, transnational list, uh, avoiding a sofa gate, uh, uh, going to more in-depth uh, changes in, in uh, policies, uh, in-depth in changes of policies like uh, defense policy, foreign policy, uh, digital, po uh, digital, the values of the European Union, so um, migration uh, and so on. So uh, they are for the moment discussing in their citizens panel, uh, I should say every topic uh, that they find uh, uh, important uh, and that they think that, that there is a, a fundamental need uh, for uh, uh, in-depth uh, reform. So uh, that's my, 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 uh, my introduction uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to 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 participate uh, uh, for a short time in in the debate and to answer the questions if there are questions naturally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Verhofstadt. Really appreciate that. Um, could I could I just maybe uh, begin with a question? I was reading one of your uh, a recent article by you. It I think it was Politico, um, and uh, you mentioned I think. Uh, that the um, uh, rather emphatically that the the Merkel break is off. You said, uh, uh, and uh, just, yeah. just a question: the Merkel break was off. I mean, the Angela Merkel break. Was oh, off. Yeah. The Merkel what break. what, what uh, exactly? Uh, what is the extent, in your opinion, of of Mrs. Merkel being kind of an inhibitor or being a, a disabler? Uh, was she really holding the process back to that extent? Well, so I have an enormous uh, esteem uh, for 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 the former uh, uh, Chancellor of Germany, for Mrs. Merkel. But the reality, uh, the the last uh, uh, twenty years uh, in Europe is is uh, is very clear. Um, we have at uh, since the reunification of Germany, uh, yeah, we have seen a German position in most of the. Uh, uh, in most of the uh, issues uh, at stake on the European level, who was quite, uh, yeah, I should say, uh, conservative, uh, not ready uh, to reform. Even when we got this enormous migration crisis uh, with all these refugees coming from Syria a few years ago, the reaction of uh, Germany was, okay, we are shuffling us, we're going to do it ourselves. It was not a European answer, it was a national answer to a European problem. Uh, but no, and it's not uh, new at all. Eh? It's since the reunification of, of, of Germany that yeah, Germany has become the biggest country of uh, the Union and is reacting a little bit, I should say, like the French in the past. So in a certain way, with the election of Mr. Macron as the French uh, president, the French became Germans in their approach of uh, Europe and the Germans became French in their approach from Europe. That's my the image that I that I always use. So it's not, they still the French speak still French and the Germans speak still German. So that's no doubt about it. But their vision about uh, about uh, about the European Union has shifted in the since the reunification, and because the French in the past was very clear, what is good for France is good for Europe, and that is a little bit the uh, the European approach of the French that changed dramatically with the new uh, French president, with Mr. Macron, while in the opposite uh, direction, uh, in Germany, uh, they were very pro-communitarian, uh, 
even a federal view uh, on, on Europe. And that changed dramatically since the reunification and also with Merkel. And what is, will happen now, so we have a, a new situation with the new German government arriving. You have seen the new German government, you have seen the agreement in the new German government. And, yeah, for the first time, in my opinion, is the most federalist uh, uh, agreement that I have ever read, uh, uh, written by a, a government uh, in the European Union. So for the first time, France and Germany are speaking again the same language on Europe, eh? I mean, on Europe. Yeah. Uh, I think. And so that's a huge opportunity for the conference also to go forward uh, with ideas who are stuck in this, uh, uh, yeah, in this, uh, I should say, uh, 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 relationship between France and, and Germany. That said, it's not enough to have an agreement between France and Germany to change something on the European level. And there are other players uh, and a small and medium sized country, certainly. Uh, who are also the co-founders of uh, of this union uh, and, and 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 other players, but it is a fundamental shift, I think, that what we have witnessed uh, the last days in the last weeks. Yeah, and um, uh, there's a little bit of an echo there. Uh, sorry, but uh, obviously we have the French elections in the, in the spring of next year, uh, in 2022. Um, um, Obviously, from what you're what you're talking about there, it would be uh, would be it would be based to some extent on Mr. Macron being re-elected as, as president of France. Um, to what extent is the um, the the the, uh, the the agenda and the 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 program for the conference and the future of Europe has that been delayed or has that been affected by 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 COVID or are we on target uh, or what is the target in terms? Yeah. Of well, of yeah. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, to launch the conference, we were uh, hugely affected by COVID. Huh? So, and then uh, COVID plays again, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a role in, in in our calendar as we discussed a few moments ago uh, by by delaying uh, the, the 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 panel in 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 uh, in Dublin. Uh, but uh, our uh, our goal uh, is that we deliver at the latest in May a first batch of conclusions. Uh, towards uh, uh, the French presidency of the European Council. That continues to be uh, the uh, the goal uh, uh, we have. So that means that after the citizens panel uh, in uh, end uh, uh, January, in uh, beginning uh, February, uh, well, we have uh, uh, February, March, April, and uh, the beginning of May to to conclude. And uh, some people are t saying to me, yeah, it's very short. Uh, is that enough time? And I'm always saying, look, in politics, that's not a problem. On the contrary, if you give to a politician too much time, he will wait until the end. I, I'm talking about, I'm speaking with I have a little bit of experience in, 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 in my political life, and I've always seen the same thing. If you have give politi to politicians too much time, well, yeah, they will wait until the last week, the last two weeks, and then start to to to, to formulate uh, compromises. So to have not a lot of time in this conference, maybe it could be an asset and not a liability. Uh, so that will create pressure to the institutions and to national parliaments to formulate their... Uh, the, because, look, to have conclusions of this conference who are uh, reading like conclusions of the European Council, that cannot be the goal. It's, it's certainly not my goal. So to have beautiful conclusions with paragraphs and chapters and phrases very well formulated in compromises who are in fact saying nothing, that's not the purpose of the conference. And therefore, therefore, the uh, participation of the citizens is crucial. But I can tell you, uh, these Citizens' representatives, they don't accept the, 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 the way, uh, the, this way of, of, of working. They want clear, clear conclusions, clear proposals, comprehensive, not complicated, and certainly not, uh, uh, yeah, uh, not uh, uh, formulated in a way that nobody understands uh, uh, them anymore. Good. Can I maybe just come to a few questions from our audience? Uh, there's a question in here from um, Jane Morris, who is the uh, is a former deputy speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, and she's the honorary president of the European Movement in Northern Ireland. 
and a former vice president of the European Economic and Social Committee. And her question is, is the EESC, the Economic and Social Committee, not representative of citizens? And what role does Mr. Verhofstadt see for the EESC in the conference? Well, the, 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 the Social Economic Committee, uh, the Committee of the Regions, uh, uh, the social partners who are also, uh, uh, all of them are in, uh, representative of the civil society organizations, are them all, they are all involved in the conference. So, and they participate in the plenary and they participate in the working groups of the plenary and they have full uh, right to intervene uh, in uh, the plenary. Moreover, uh, the uh, chair of the Social Economic Committee as the, uh, uh, also the chair of the, of, uh, the Committee of the Regions and uh, of uh, uh, the social partners are, uh, uh, are member of the executive board organizing uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the conference. So there is a, a full, uh, a full in, in involvement uh, uh, of, uh, of them. Okay, I think you also said in your remarks that uh, one third of the citizens were youth, were, were from the youth uh, sector, yeah. uh, which is obviously very, very good. There's a question here from Mark McNulty from the National Youth Council of Ireland. Um, uh, he's a representative of the uh, European Youth Forum. And he wants to know, following concerns from youth delegates across Europe, how does Mr. Verhofstadt believe we can further uh, meaningfully uh, involve uh, youth participation throughout the conference and in all future EU decision making. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, these 800 people have uh, been selected randomly uh, 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 through the whole population in, 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 in Europe. And so they are not representing an organization, hmm? these 800 people. I can tell you that this so every citizens panel is 200 people. Uh, in, in every of the citizens panel, more than 190 of these people, of these citizens, have never been in contact with politics, have never participated to an experience as this, have no uh, political link or whatever. So what we the the, the selection has been done in a in a, in, in, in a random way so that uh, we have really representative citizens and one third of them are younger than uh, uh, than 25 so uh, as i explained it over a representation uh, the second is that we uh, have put into the uh, conference also uh, the possibility for the for the european youth event that uh, we have organized we have organized uh, a few weeks ago in the beginning of october european youth event where yeah, well, nearly, I think, uh, also remotely, nearly 10,000 young, young people have participated in it. Uh, and uh, the conclusions of the European Youth Invent uh, uh, are one of the, uh, the sources of, of the reflection in the citizens' panels and in the uh, conference. And thirdly, uh, if it depends from me, I would make uh, such a, a conference and these citizens' panels a permanent tool in the union with a permanent uh, active participation of uh, the young uh, the young people uh, uh, and uh, not to do that uh, i should say every day but i think one or two times in a legislative period of 5 years that would not be a stupid idea to organize such a permanent uh, active participation of citizens uh, last, uh, last point is that the, the chair of the European Youth Forum uh, is also very much involved uh, in the executive board and so on, and she's leading one of the nine working groups in the plenary. So we uh, we have given a special role she's the, uh, uh, to the, 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 the chair of the European Youth Forum in the whole exercise. Yeah, inevitably, um, uh, you know, the youth and maybe the, the citizens panel maybe will be on the very ambitious side, uh, I suspect, of a, the future of Europe. To what extent would you be a little bit concerned that, depending on what happens, of course, and it's right that there should be ambition, but if this ambition is not realized, uh, you know, if, 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 if it is frustrated, uh, could that turn into something that would be very negative in terms of uh, the kind of the, the, the permanent tool 
uh, that this uh, you know these citizens panels and maybe the youth involvement uh, may, may 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 in other words could it turn into a negative thing if there's a level of frustration in the end yeah, of the I, I agree with you that's yeah, I agree with you that's a, that that's a, but that's exactly uh, the argument that I want and uh, that that uh, we need to use towards those who are reluctant in saying yeah okay uh, if 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 uh, citizens show ambition and, and, and courage in formulating their proposals. It's now your time to show courage and ambition in formulating your answers to these uh, uh, recommendations of the citizens. I know that is a that is a danger, but it's also an opportunity, an opportunity uh, uh, to push. Uh, uh, yeah, I should say the institutions and 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 the stakeholders of the union uh, in a direction that they were never ready to do so. Yeah. Uh, I, look, um, let me give me uh, one example: uh, unanimity, uh, uh, decision making uh, uh, in in the in, in the union. It's, I think still a huge obstacle in the union. Huh? So you see that in migration policy, uh, where the uh, council decided uh, that everything would be decided by unanimity. You see that on the economic uh, field. You see that certainly geopolitically. Every time when there is a crisis in our neighborhood, we are not capable to to respond immediately. To it, it takes weeks, months, uh, from time to time, to re to react with with uh, uh, sanctions, for example, in one or other case, uh, and, and and that is uh, that is weakening uh, the union. So if now uh, citizens are asking to delete uh, 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 and, and 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 to abolish it, well, it will be very difficult now from now on to say, no, 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 we're going to keep it. So European Parliament is asking for, European Bill Commission is asking for, national uh, parliaments are saying, yeah, it's not a bad idea. And the, and, the, uh, and that based on a recommendation of citizens. What will then the member states say? No, we continue like in the past. So it's it's a threat. It's a danger that exists, uh, what, you, uh, what, what you describe. But at the same time, uh, it will create uh, pressure to do things that were uh, un in impossible in the past. Okay. Question here from uh, Peter Gunning, who's a member of our institute and a former, indeed, Irish ambassador. He wants to know, or he asks the question, would it not be better, uh, be a better use of EU time, resources and political effort to focus on maximizing the use of the existing potential of the unused provisions of the Lisbon Treaty? Uh, given the busy EU schedule, work schedule between now and 2025, for example, in the area of qualified voting or defence and security. I suppose the point is, uh, are there not uh, sufficient provisions there already within the Lisbon Treaty, maybe that haven't been fully exploited or fully, um, fully developed? They are never used. That's the reality. Uh, they, like, <laughs> so uh, let, 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 let's take the, the example of the passerelle. Eh? The passerelle uh, is the, the possibility to go from a unanimity uh, decision making to qualified majority decision making. Hmm. It, it has never been used. It, it, I, I remember that uh, I think it was in Nice, some words at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, that we decided to uh, to agree uh, on this on on on, on passerelles, and it has been taken on board also uh, in the uh, uh, in 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 the convention, uh, the passerelle as the way uh, to solve that. But it has never been used. Every time when a proposal is made to use the passerelle, uh, it it disappears uh, in 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 in, in uh, uh, and. There is no no will uh, to uh, to use the passerelle. So, okay, uh, that's a potential of the existing treaties, but in the reality, it's not. Uh, so we need to put again the question on the table. So to say simply, oh, the problem of the unanimity, well, you have the passerelle, use the passerelle, well, you see for more than a decade that uh, it is never used. Uh, the opposite is happening. Migration, for example, in the treaties is qualified majority. Well, the council decided to go to unanimity decision making in migration. The reason why we have still no migration policy after after uh, more than two decades, we decided that this was a European uh, matter. So instead of using the passerelle in one way, we are using the passerelle today in the other way, going from qualified majority to unanimity. That is happening in practice. So saying that there is a lot of potential in the in 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 the existing treaties, yeah, is a very theoretical uh, assumption 
but without any practical consequences. The reality is, no, we don't use them. I have a question here from um, a gentleman uh, from the Netherlands, Renze de Kezier, uh, from the Berenschot Consulting uh, Group in the Netherlands. He wants to know, what is Mr. Verhofstadt's opinion about the EU's um, future strategic autonomy? And I know you referred to, uh, I think your first remarks were that we uh, there's a new world order there uh, and we need a new EU to deal with this new reality, these new global yeah. strategic reality. Um, to, to what extent do you think that that is, is something where Europe can begin to uh, better organize itself and its, its uh, ambition to be more autonomous, strategically autonomous, uh, can be realized? Yeah, I think that will be one of the key uh, issues uh, during the conference that we will discuss. Uh, that's already the case by the uh, by in the two first rounds of the citizens panels. Uh, we have seen that uh, they are talking uh, uh, very intensively uh, uh, about about that uh, the geopolitical weakness of Europe, uh, the uh, uh, yeah strategic autonomy uh, of 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 Europe, and that put uh, a lot of questions on our plate. Naturally, the question of uh, uh, decision making in foreign policy. Uh, so we are again back to unanimity <laughs> here. Uh, secondly, the whole issue of defense uh, and yeah, the new world order, uh, in, in my opinion, creates a situation in which um, we have uh, we need to have the ambition and the courage to talk about defense on the European level. Look, when uh, Joe Biden came to uh, the NATO headquarters a few weeks ago uh, to the NATO headquarters in Brussels a few weeks ago, what was he talking about? He said he talked about China when he came to the NATO headquarters. In my opinion, if I'm not mistaken, uh, China lies in the South Pacific, yeah? not in the North Atlantic. Yeah? It's South Pacific territory, not North Atlantic. But nevertheless, he comes to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and he talks about the South Pacific, about China. And that is proof of the fact that the world order is completely different uh, today than the one uh, when we started, when we founded uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Yeah. There is an absolute lead, I think, for a world treaty organization in which liberal democracies, countries with liberal democracies, defend themselves on a world level and not only on a North Atlantic uh, level. And that give, uh, puts the question forward, do, don't we need to organize our defense in a totally uh, other way? Uh, uh, still inside the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but with a European defense that is uh, more enhanced than we have today, because let's not fool the people. We spend a lot of money on defense. Huh? We spend uh, around $250 billion every year in Europe on defense. Eh? And I don't talk about uh, the budget of the UK. That's four times more than the Russians. We spend four times more than the Russians on defense in Europe. But we are not capable when they come this way to stop them without American help. So there is an enormous waste of money. I am always saying the biggest waste of money in the European Union, you know what it is? Defense. Because we are duplicating every day 28 times the same thing. So that will be one of the issues on the table, because you cannot talk about strategic autonomy uh, worldwide if you have not the guts to talk about the hardware, too, about defense. Thank you. And um, just before uh, we have about five or six minutes left, Guy, if we may, and I want to just make sure that uh, just to offer our panelists, uh, Jane and uh, Deirdre and um, um, Alice Mary, if they want to jump in at this stage, maybe uh, to, to, uh, to, to say anything to you uh, before we... We, 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 we bid you a uh, good day. Uh, please, um, Jane, um, Deirdre, uh, Alice Berry, if you want to talk directly to uh, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Uh, community. So may, may, maybe Deirdre, if you've got anything to suggest. No, um, well, I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I agree a lot with Mr. What, what Guy has said, because what I wanted, what we want to do, and one of the questions that we probably, we had in the last, um, uh, the working group meetings was that there was, Two politicians were too eager to speak and things to say. So we really want to uh, keep this at arm's length. Let's hear what the citizens have to say because we have something to say every day of the week on every yeah. subject. But just let's keep it um, for see what comes from the citizens and maybe 
maybe some of it will be already there or maybe it'll be new but then you know when we get into the discussions and the deliberations I think that's going to be the very interesting thing so from my point of view at this stage just want to hear exactly what comes from the citizens panels I think it's very interesting we've as you know we've had, we've had experience of similar with our citizens assembly in Ireland people from all walks of life drawn on a on a um well, chosen on a random basis. So um, I think it'll be it'll be exciting, and I already see some of the themes coming through that you've covered there. Um, you know, like strategic autonomy, defence, uh, defence, moving to cyber security, making sure that um, Europe is invests enough in innovation and research and education, so that we are we have those strengths. So really, I think the most important thing for all of us, uh, from a political point of view, is to to listen and to see what comes in those citizens assemblies, and then engage. Yeah, Alice, Mary, do you want to just come in at the stage? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I've, loads to, I've loads of thoughts. Uh, I won't tell the back on them. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think the discussion on defence, we need to be really clear there's a problem where we just speak about defence and we don't speak about peace building. And to be honest, peace building is a piece that is not strong enough within the discussion of the context of the future of Europe. We know, for example, money went to the European Defence Fund, but it didn't go to the uh, strategic it didn't uh, it was taken away from some of the social coherence funding which is actually a uh, social cohesion funding which is actually what has contributed to us getting through and of course defense is is a little bit of an elephant in the room on the climate emissions too so i think we need to be really careful in this and i, I perhaps I, I really appreciate the passion that that uh, mr Verhofstadt has had for this process i think a lot i liked a lot of what he was saying but i i don't have the same maybe skepticism about that we are in a new order of superpowers. I actually think that's still a debate because we are in a position now where is it a politics of superpowers for the future or is it a politics of principle? And the multilateral institutions that we created uh, coming out of World War II, it's really important that that multilateralism, that idea of principles, and for example, acting in favor of our interests uh, is not always the same as acting in favor of values, and the interests of, for example, commercial parties may not always be the same as the interests of citizens. And what's really struck me from what citizens have been saying is the rights frame, that values frame, the rights frame has come through so strongly in what citizens have been saying in the plenaries, coming out of assemblies, in the digital plank. And I think that's where Europe needs to really be quite strong and actually having a common rights frame uh, distributively uh, and holding each other to account on it is the kind of thing that, that builds credibility. Um, I think there's lots of things on the process. I'm sure I'll have opportunities to engage with Mr. Verhofstadt on that uh, in the future, but I do think we do need to have uh, maybe more of an, even more of an active outreach. And I think it's really important, separate to this process, one of the things we've seen is people are concerned about uh, corporate lobbyists, for example, uh, undermining civil society. So while a citizen's assembly is a great thing, be it you know, short-term or permanent, also making sure that civil societies and the alarm bells they bring up are heard uh, in the, the kinds of discussions that are still happening right now on Fit for 55 on the digital platform. It's really important people don't feel there's a whole separate process of the real decisions. And lastly on that, I think, the economic governance review that the European Commission are doing at the moment, it's really important that that doesn't end up straitjacketing the kind of transformative proposals that might come out of the future of Europe process. Okay, thank you, uh, Alice. Mary, maybe Jane, if you want to come in and then we'll ask you to wrap up, okay? Yeah, sure. So th thanks very much. I'll be quick because I know uh, I know the key has to leave now in a, in a minute. So I, I thought it was interesting. One of the things that I've been um, and trying to reflect on is the, the balance of... Uh, the balance between the kind of three institutions and the and the three co-chairs and um you know as Guy was reflecting there there's a difference in the um the objectives and people who who would like this to be as strong as possible and others who would prefer it to be um, a talking shop and he talked there about the number of proposals it struck me um you know when we had our first constitutional convention we put a lot of things into it. And then when we reflected on it, we realized that actually it was too much. So by the time we had our third, we just did gender equality. And I wonder whether the, the number of proposals in there is in some way strategic, which will allow a kind of a, a cherry picking of you know which ones are going to be chosen and which ones aren't and uh, how he would reflect on, on that. 
Okay. So here, I'm going to ask you to wrap up, if I may, just reflecting on some yeah, of the questions. Maybe, uh, maybe I can limit myself to the questions that were uh, linked uh, and the remarks uh, that have been made linked to the organization of the... Uh, because when we have to talk about defense and geopolitical weakness, we can continue, I think, for a few weeks uh, on, 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 on this. Uh, 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 certainly uh, a new... Uh, uh, situation uh, uh, worldwide. But on, on, on this, first, it's true that, um, as my colleague in the European Parliament has said, uh, there was too much a classical reaction by politicians in the working group starting to uh, overshadow uh, the, the citizens. So we have made now a few recommendations to the chairs of the working groups to avoid that. Uh, we want that every time a working group starts with a report by the citizens' representatives on where they are in the panels. And there will be also a reporting to the plenary, not only by the chair of the uh, working group, but also by uh, a representative of the citizens' panel, so that it is a common, uh, a common reporting and not a unilateral reporting uh, by the politician, if I can say that. I, mean, I, I am myself. Uh, a, a politician. And then, uh, s uh, secondly, uh, yeah, there, um, there, uh, the, 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 there are uh, certainly uh, different expectations by, by the three uh, uh, institutions, uh, but what is important is that um, uh, the, all three have recognized the absolutely uh, prioritization of the way we do it. Uh, that's that it are the citizens panels themselves who decide what the items are. It's not we. We don't we didn't say, oh, you have to reflect on unanimity, you have to reflect on defense, you have to reflect on on so far gate. We didn't do that. They have in the first round of the panels uh, defined themselves what the items are. And I have to tell you, uh, the, those who uh, are uh, the, the consortium, as we call them, who are organizing this and helping the citizens' panels, uh, have done a good job in, in the sense that they have limited the number of streams and that will limit the number also of proposals that will go to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the plenary. Because it's true, uh, the professor said, uh, it's, it has no. Uh, it's no. It has no sense to make a catalog of the of the 100, 200, 300 ideas that are flowing uh, on the digital platform and in the citizens' panels. Uh, what we need from uh, the citizens' uh, panels are clear recommendations, and uh, yeah, that can be limited. Huh? Uh, and and that's it. That's the way uh, they are working on. Naturally, the third round, so the final round, where they formulate the recommendations, uh, only starts, yeah, not now in Dublin, next weekend, but a week after, the weekend after in, in, in Florence. But the, the goal is to limit it to, uh, 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 for every panel, uh, something, I don't know, I don't want to put a figure on it, but it will be certainly around 15 proposals or something like that recommendations not more than that okay well listen we're going to we're going to say thank you to you um uh, mr hostucky and just to say uh we very much appreciate your your taking the time out we wish we had been seeing you in dublin this weekend as you know it's not quite to be but first weekend in february we certainly look forward to and we at the ida look forward also to our um uh, participation and support uh, of, of, of the initiative uh, uh, in the first weekend in, in, in February. So thank you very much indeed. I think Alice Mary said you are you you speak with passion. You certainly do. You're, there's no lack of passion there, and we very much appreciate your involvement. So we're going to continue the conversation now, but we'll 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 thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye bye bye. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, we can now turn. Uh, obviously, we've heard from uh, Mr. Rahofstad. And we just now turn to uh, the panel for their comments, maybe their observations, and maybe critique as well, critiques as well of the, the conference. And just let me introduce again our panelists. We have Deirdre Clune, an MEP, who represents Ireland South for Fine Gael in the European Parliament, and is the, uh, is the Fine Gael representative on the, uh, to the conference. She currently serves on the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection as well as uh, the delegations for relations with the countries of Central America. 
and to the Euro uh, Latin America Parliamentary Assembly. Before joining the European uh, Parliament, she served as Lord Mayor of Cork, of course, as TD for Cork South Central, and as a senator in Shannon Aaron. And um, Senator Alice Mary Higgins uh, is an independent senator in Shannon Aaron, where she leads uh, the civil uh, engagement group and is a member of the committees on environment and climate action, finance and public expenditure and reform, and on disability matters. Before her election to the Shannon, she was a policy coordinator at the National Women's Council of Ireland, member of the executive of uh, the European Women's Lobby in Brussels, and worked uh, for the Older and Bolder Alliance, Trocra, Kolov, NGOs on home care, climate change, peace building, and anti-racism issues. And then finally, we have, of course, uh, Jane Souter, uh, who's a professor in the School of Communications at uh, Dublin City University, DCU, and uh, she's the director of the DCU Institute uh, for Future Media, Democracy, and Society, and is an expert on the information environment in the public sphere, scaling up deliberation and tackling disinformation. She is a, she's a senior research fellow on the Irish Citizens Assembly on Gender Equality, a founding member of We the Citizens, Ireland's first deliberative experiment, and a, a member of the stewarding group on the Scottish Citizens Assembly and of the OECD's Future Democracy Network. Um, uh, Professor Souter was named the Irish Research Council's Researcher of the Year in 2020. So just a reminder to everybody that the, um, the address uh, and the co contributions are all on the record, as is the Q&A. So, and to continue joining us on Twitter as you're doing using the IIEA handle at IIEA and at EP in Ireland. So maybe I could just get the conversation going, maybe to you first, Deirdre, if I may. Um, you, you, um, you spoke there about, um, you know, we were talking about strategic autonomy indeed. Mm -hmm. What changes uh, does the European Parliament want to see come out of the conference? And indeed, I suppose, looking at it from, uh, and indeed, is institutional reform likely or possible? And, you know, do you, from a party political point of view, I suppose, have any particular priorities that you want to see addressed and indeed delivered on as well? Um, thanks, Michael. No, I, I don't think I have any particular priorities. Um, number one, I, what, what I want and I hope from it is that we'll get more engagement and discussion on Europe and create a better understanding because it is a, a difficult concept to understand. And I know this, uh, the three institutions and how decisions are made. Um, but to have have more engagement, I think um, you know as the opening point that Guy made there when he was addressing about the fact that we are now post Brexit, and and that is it. That is a different Europe. It's a different Europe for us in Ireland. Uh, I read a statistic one time. Heard a statistic at the time that when the UK, United, the population of the United Kingdom was equivalent to the low, the smaller nineteen member states. If you can understand where I'm going, that that's how significant it was. Very strong economy. Fifth, sixth, maybe it's, I'm not sure where it is now in terms of in the world strongest economy. So it's had a, a major impact. It's changing now that Europe is more. Um, we see the, the the dynamics changing. The centre of gravity has shifted more to the east. Um, one of the issues that came up, and I'm on the working group democracy and oh, not so much so how EU in the world, and um, there was a strong desire there to see that the Western Balkans would be included. In the deliberation process now, um, because they potentially maybe become members of the of, of the European Union. So, so my point is, we really we need in Ireland particularly is to to um, create more awareness and just and not an, an awareness of the issues that are going on and the way the dynamic of, U of Europe is changing and is changing for all of us. And we're, we're part of the decision making process in terms of our elected representatives, our our government. And um, I, I am always conscious that we hear this. Oh. Europe, we don't understand what's going on. There's a, is there a democratic deficit? Um, the European Parliament is the, the forum that's directly elected by the people. But um, I, I mean, you know, I, I, you take it that it is a difficult, it is difficult to, to communicate and get the message across. It's hard to try people, uh, people, individuals, um, they don't know, or they say they, you know, there's too, too much, it's too diff it's difficult to get the concept. Um, so, um, I'd like to see I think certainly more awareness. I think the opening point in, in the with the citizens panel where they were asked, you know, pitch yourself to 2050. That's not, not today, but 2050 in a world that has, will have changed. China will be stronger, the US, well, India as well play a role in that. 
And where do you see Europe in that when we've only maybe 5% of world population uh, and a population close to 9.8, 9. billion people, Europe's population will only be 5% there. Where do we want that Europe to be? And I think the fact that there's so many young people involved, that the proportion of young people is involved is, is, is very worthwhile, very important in those decisions because it is their, their future. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but what I want, I mean, I, I try not, I don't think the European part, it's what the European Parliament has any concrete expectations in terms of policy, but certainly um, want um, more engagement and, and engagement with citizens and feel citizens are, rather than bringing Europe to the citizens, now we're bringing the citizens to Europe. Um, and, and do you think just uh, uh, that, you know, I mean, obviously we, we, we see the Eurobarometer uh, polling on, mm. on support for Europe in Ireland, which is extraordinarily high. In fact, I think it's probably the highest in Europe. Um, I mean, are we living in a kind of, um, are we deluding ourselves a little bit um, in thinking that, you know, the, 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 you know that, that uh, this support will be carried forward through thick and thin, regardless of almost what Europe does? I mean, there's a level of support here now such that we can carry almost any amendments in Europe or any future Europe that the, 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 that the conference might envisage? Um, no, I don't think so. I, don't, I wouldn't take for granted the level of support for Europe at all. I think, we, but we, uh, yes, you're right. From a Europe barometer point of view, we are doing, for, uh, we are doing um, a very popular Europe. Europe is very popular in Ireland. And I get that sentiment. Um, I, don't, I think I don't need the European barometer to tell me that. But, you know, we're coming probably at the moment from post-COVID where we see the value of Europe in terms of purchasing vaccines, in terms of organising travel certs. They were important, concrete steps that people could see uh, the value of being a small country, member of a bigger block and what it, what it brought to us. So, but, but I mean, that can shift, that can change. If there's, I mean, I'm, the, you know, what, what, what can come out of this? Maybe we're happy with... Um, the decision making that it's unanimous maybe we, we want we're happy with that maybe some some decisions might come out that, that they won't be popular and, and maybe there would be treaty change uh, proposals who knows i mean i think keep it i know our, gov our government probably wouldn't want to see a treaty change our proposals and that but i think we should keep it um just see see how it goes and put everything that that, that comes and that is deemed to be uh, of, of issue of concern to the to the conference put that in the final document um, but you know we've had we've had difficult uh, referenda in Ireland, and people have voted probably you know on um, things that weren't relevant to the to the in, to the referendum. But you know that's good. I think it's good. We've had discussion. We've had good discussions in Ireland on Europe and our membership there and what it involves. And when you look at what happened in Brexit, uh, the UK they didn't they didn't have those kind of engaging discussions that we have had. I think they've been to our benefit discussions. Uh, As Mary, if I could come to you, obviously, from the perspective of the National Parliament, uh, the, uh, you're coming at it from obviously within the, that, that parliament from the Shannon. Um, you know, to what extent do you think uh, you know, Irish priorities and um, issues uh, are being addressed or have been addressed or are included uh, in the kind of the, the, the conference uh, the, the, the program as outlined? Um, well, I think, first of all, um, from the National Parliament perspective, um, it's, I think it's important, we almost segue away, there's a couple of issues that I think are Irish priorities, but in general I think that we don't see that we're thinking of Irish priorities. What it really is that there's a number of really important choices about Europe and what position will Ireland take in relation to those choices. So, you know, that's one of the things I think sometimes when we've had almost a transactional, a, 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 a transactional understanding of the relationship with Europe. You know, we support Europe and Europe supports us, rather than that kind of almost transformative moment that we're at now, which is, you know, what is Europe? And like the really big debates that are happening in Europe, the conference on the future of Europe is really important. Um, what I was kind of, I'll say it slower now, <laughs> but what I was saying uh, there is that there's also a number of discussions happening that are continuing and being negotiated in parallel with this future of Europe process. So there's the really big discussions about climate. There's probably going to be more climate legislation in you know, the next 12 months than in a very long period of time. So you know this Fit for 55 package from the EU, which is lots of legislation, lots of which will um, Ireland will need to input in relation to that EU legislation on climate, but also Ireland then will need to decide how it's going to transpose it. So one thing that I think we need to do as a national parliament is really get into that two-way process that we don't see ourselves, you know, so for example, um, 
that we're giving input early into the process um, of discussions and policy. And then something you'll be maybe aware of, you know, the Shannad is looking at the moment to play a much hard, a stronger role where EU directives are being transposed by statutory instrument that we would really engage in to, uh, with that and we would give scrutiny. So there's, there's those processes, there's the debate on defence, there's a debate on climate, there's a really big debate on digitalization. Are we going with an empowerment frame, a rights-based frame? Are we going to let a cybersecurity defense frame dominate our defense, our, our, our policies, or let industry? Because I think we got something right with GDPR. So I would say they're priorities for Irish citizens, if you know what I mean. They're priorities for the people who talk to me. And what I'm trying to encourage people, I really encourage everybody, is to engage with the digital platform and let the ideas, they're not solely Irish priorities, but they're your views as an EU citizen on decisions that are genuinely being made in the next 12 months to 24 months. Okay. Um, I would say two things that are important from the Irish priorities, however, one specific issue is, as I mentioned, the peace building component has not been as strong. You know, peace and security kind of got pushed together, but the fact is, and we know this very well in Ireland, peace building and security are not exactly the same thing. They're both important, but they take different work. And I think that peace building piece isn't, uh, hasn't been put into the frame as much as it should. So that's one issue that I think we definitely need to, to, to highlight more. Um, and that's going to be important in terms of unanimity voting, in terms of policies. You know, that is something we're going to have to be very careful on, that we offer something different in, in that discussion. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's lots of other priorities. Maybe one last thing I would just say on civil society, because I represent the, you know, I'm leader of the civil engagement group at the Shannon. And civil society in Ireland, we actually have really strong civil society actors from Ireland who are part of this process. But what's really important is that we do strengthen the listening to civil society within all these other decision-making spaces and that we don't have them sidelined whereby you almost have citizens talking in the future of Europe process and then the same voices as usual getting listened to um, in terms of hard decision making, including the economic governance decision making. Okay, okay. And uh, maybe just if I could come to you, Jane, um, on the, uh, just uh, how uh, would you rate, I mean, how do you think the, uh, the conference is doing in terms of, and how does it compare to our own experience uh, in terms of the, uh, the Irish constitutional cons cons consultative exercises like the, the, the Citizens' Assembly or, or indeed the Constitutional Convention? Have they got the formula um, and, and I, I'm sure they looked at the way we did things and, and have been doing things to very, very good effect. But are they getting it right? I mean, uh, is the structure pretty good? Um, well, I think you're right. I think they learned a lot uh, from us. And in fact, I think, you know, the very fact that Ireland had the Constitution Convention and Citizen Assembly was, uh, you know, key for the, the French assemblies, the German ones, and then for the discussion and the Conference for Future of Europe. I think obviously it's much more difficult because you know you've got the you know as Guy was talking about there the you know the three different elements the three co-chairs and trying to do it the parliament is obviously a strong supporter but there's you know a lot more division in the council as I as I understand it you know there's parts of the commission have different agendas um, and then just the logistical thing about about trying to do it and the and the time frame so i think it's really ambitious and really it's probably best to see it as a as a really good pilot project to see you know how can this work and you you could even hear Guy when he was talking there about you know they learned in the beginning that when the citizens went into the first plenary it became almost like a kind of committee of the parliament you know, the citizens didn't really have their, their voice there. So now they're going to learn and it'll be a little bit different in, in Florence next week. And then you have the whole thing, you know, in, in Ireland, we spend a long time thinking about, you know, who exactly are the experts who are going to be brought in? Are they going to be balanced? What, you know, what are the, the different ones where, whereas it's kind of, I suppose, with COVID and things here, you know, it's a bit more about who's available and, you know, who, who do you know? So again, I think they're kind of learning about that. So even when you look at the unanimity kind of debates, you know, there haven't been the same number of voices who maybe have brought up about, well, what's the perspective of small countries within that debate? You know, so 
um, it's the commission that's looking at the, or it's the the organisers who are kind of looking at the at the experts. Whereas in Ireland, we'd have a, an academic panel who'd be proposing the experts in the different areas, and then the citizens would would be okaying it. So I think it's a really good process. I think it's really ambitious, um, but I think we should see it as a pilot as a pilot process. And you know, when you look at the um, the new program for government in Germany, you can see that the, the three parties there are talking about, you know, institutionalizing it the way that he was talking, you know, making it more permanent. I think that's a really interesting proposal. And then in that, I think, you know, to talk to people like um, like Catherine Day, you know, who, who have been kind of running ours to understand the kind of, well, what are the, the, the kind of real building blocks that we need in there to, to, to carry it on to ensure the kind of quality. And there's a lot of people observing it. You know, I have colleagues all over Europe and universities all over Europe who are observing different parts every weekend. And I think to really look at those kind of observations and, and build it in. So I think, it, I think it's great, but it's so challenging on some, you know, such a huge agenda. Um, the multilingual thing, the, the different platforms. I think civil society is, is in it to a much greater extent than actually we have. So, you know, civil society tends to be giving evidence in the Irish processes, whereas here they're actually in, you know, and that's a power imbalance with citizens. So there's a, there's a lot to learn. And uh, so I think it's really exciting and I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying watching it, but I think it's, it's nice to see it as like a really interesting pilot project and then to think strategically about how we carry it on afterwards. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, the decision making processes in Europe are already pretty complex and indeed convoluted, labyrinthine indeed. I mean, is there the whole citizen dimension important at all as it is? Is it just going to add another layer of, of complexity to the whole, to that whole already very complex process? No, I think it's really important. So I think like we understand the the importance of um, of deliberation and you can look at this globally and the importance of actually properly actually listening to citizens voices and, you know, asking people's top of the head opinions in Eurobarometer is very different to understanding well, you know, what is people's considered opinion when they've actually heard the pros and cons of arguments when they've been given the time and space to deliver with it. And I think that that's it's really important in terms of delivering increased legitimacy for uh, for decision making, and you can see how this is um, becoming more accepted. You know, Paris had its very first meeting of a hundred randomly selected citizens just this week. You know, so they actually have a permanent citizen assembly in in Paris now, which which is really interesting. You can see how this has happened in you know parts of the Belgian Parliament, which have gone like this where there's a permanent citizen um, assembly in Ostbelgium, the, the uh, German speaking part of Belgium. And, you know, it's it's more part of the German parliament. So I think we can see that, you know, politicians and decision makers are increasingly seeing the kind of threat from uh, creeping authoritarianism in, in, um, in other parts of the world. You can see the threat from populism. And this is certainly a kind of a legitimacy building exercise that that can help counter that. So I think it's really important to, to include. Okay, um, Deirdre, back to you, if I may. Um, uh, so, I mean, we, we'd, we'd all like to believe, I mean, and there is this uh, obviously very important citizen dimension to, to this, but in terms of broader awareness of, of the initiative, uh, would you be, would you be um, in any way confident or uh, that, that, you know, people have a, a, have a general awareness that this initiative is underway uh, and um, what can we do better, I suppose, to to make people aware of it or to promote it uh, as, as something that is a very important kind of um, initiative in the context of the future of Europe? Um, yeah, no, I wouldn't be very happy, really, that there is a broad awareness of it. But I'm very happy with the citizens panels and I think the way they have been chosen and their participation, I think that's a, an excellent process. Um, we've seen how well it worked here, as, as James has said. So, you know, I'm very happy with that side of it. But if you look at the... Um, the portal whereby you can people can put in their comments and just respond and um, I don't think that's been very strong and I think actually I read some of the comments going back to the citizens panel those who were chosen didn't know anything about it when they got the phone call could would they like to participate they didn't know about it and um, I think it's, it's it's a challenge to communicate that this is happening 
Uh, I know there's some uh, events planned in Ireland as well to communicate that and to try and get to get to get the message out there and to get away from from, from civil society. Just get to regular people, if regular people, if we can, like people is you know. Uh, sitting around their kitchen table, bring in a few neighbours, have a say, or if you're a member of a club, you know, football club, whatever, hockey club, GA, whatever, just that you would maybe, if, if we could get to that level where people would discuss it, and I know that's a, a big leap, but that's what we, what we want to do. But I, just, I do think there is a lot, uh, we need to do a lot more in terms of uh, building awareness around it and saying, you know, this is going on, have your say, because it is your future. And you can have a say, even in, you know, if you're part of an organization, if you're just a sm small group, you can you can have your just give a comment. You don't necessarily have to prepare a document uh, or you can just give a few sentences on what you think. You can look at what's going on. You can tune into all the events. So I think the platform is really, really interesting. Um, unfortunately, maybe COVID, too, hasn't hasn't helped us. Absolutely. I mean, if we had the citizens panel in Ireland, if it was live and if it was an, an in-person event now this weekend I think there would have been a lot of um, media coverage around it uh, and, and particularly if um, Guy was in Dublin uh, I think that would have been uh, you know created more awareness and would have got more coverage so you know we need to try and do more whatever we can and just in terms of getting into the media and, and reaching out uh, and try and get as many voices as possible so you know, I, I'm not saying I don't think it's 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 there is an awareness that there should be the same level of awareness that I would like anyway at this point. Okay, well, um, maybe just, Alice, Mary, we're coming towards the end here and maybe just one final question to you and then maybe back to Jane. Uh, so, I mean, are, are we ready for, I mean, uh, Giver Hofstadt speaks in, in, in rather ambitious, I mean, he's, he's he obviously is, uh, as uh, you described him as a man of uh, some passion on all of this. Is, is he way out ahead? Is he way beyond uh, what is likely to be kind of a, uh, um, the, 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 end, the end product of all this. I mean, he doesn't lack ambition. Uh, he doesn't lack passion, as you say, but is, is, is this really, um, are, is Europe ready for this kind of level of ambition? Well, I, I think the important thing to remember is decisions are being made. Decisions are being made and they're being made all the time. And I always say about policy, um, in the end, all policy is just decisions we make about how we live, how we want to live together, be that at local level, be it at national, be it at EU level. And that's why I would just really echo what Deirdre was saying. Anybody who's ever had a, a view on how we should be living together in their own place or their own town or community should definitely try to engage with that digital platform, particularly women, because we don't have enough women engaging there, and give those views because those views are relevant to how we live together in Europe. So the way I would say it's not necessarily about a level, the level of ambition, but the fact is really big decisions will be made and the future of Europe process will either be an effective way for citizens to influence those decisions or it won't. There's going to be really big decisions on climate. And I mentioned the economic governance. The European Commission, I don't think it's necessarily the life, ideal, but in a parallel, they're doing a review on, you know, what comes after the suspension of fiscal rules? You know, what comes next there? And that we know that, you know, Brexit was mentioned as a game changer. But the other big game changer was 10 years of austerity across Europe, which really did lead to a lot of dissociation from people. So there's an acknowledgement that transformation is needed. Big decisions will be made. Uh, it's going to be really important about whether they're, you know, we go back to very short term thinking or we're making the kind of uh, COVID is almost emergency bridging. But many of those who say we have to kind of shift the rules is this is now the transformation discussion. And it's on digital, it's on rights, and it's on environment. So there is going the outcomes are going to be potentially significant. And this is where it's up to really citizens to try and influence and input and make sure that they have a say and that they shape, uh, they shape how the decisions are being made. Um, I would say um, the rights piece, because I said I'm on the I'm on the rights working group, the rights and values working group of this whole future of Europe process. I'm the national par a national parliamentarian on that. I think that that's going to be really fundamental. And I worry a little bit that we hear a lot about the interests, the big blocks. But that question, when you actually talk to citizens about, if it's just about getting legitimacy for a centralization of power, then you may risk a future alienation. Whereas if it's something like agreeing on values and rights and having those distributively owned and by people across Europe, 
I think that's going to be a more robust outcome in the long term. And, and that is important. And I, I, I can't really finish if we talk on COVID just without mentioning the TRIPS waiver, which is an example where citizens are well ahead of the Commission. And indeed, the European Parliament are actually ahead of the Commission in terms of saying that's an example whereby how Europeans want to identify themselves is as having rights and supporting rights. So again, I'm saying those things not as an add-on, but because I think they're key to whether this is successful. Uh, Jane, I'm going to give the last word to you. I mean, um, this obviously is quite an ambitious uh, uh, project. I mean, are, are, and as you say, involving, uh, as Guy said, involving a considerable level of youth participation. I think he, the figure is one third, 33% involves youth. I mean, uh, is there, uh, just to come back to the question I asked him, is there the potential here, and maybe there was in our own conventions as well, of setting ourselves up, particularly our young people up, to uh, experience this process and end up deeply frustrated at the end of it? Well, that's obviously the the issue. So that's why, um, like, not just for young people, but for for citizens overall. So you know, the really important thing is, you know, to say very clearly where any recommendations are going to go, and this is why we need to be clear about, you know, are there's so, there's so many here? Is is this a, a kind of a pilot, or is this something that the council is going to do, or is it just going to note the recommendations? You know, it's quite possible that you just get that. You know, the council has noted the recommendations, and then we move on. And then that's obviously going to be very difficult in terms of uh, communicating it, so people go again. But I think if we kind of talk about, well, look, this is what had. These are the kind of things that people did, and maybe actually if there's some sort of recommendation for, you know, should there be a permanent citizen's assembly? And then that can be something that's taken on rather than the specifics of, you know, what could be at, at least 50 policy proposals across four different areas, you know what I mean? So you're talking about 200 different things, you know, how's, how are you even going to measure what's been, uh, what's been taken on there? But I think it is really, um, I think it is really good that there's an overrepresentation of of youth. The Scottish did that in their in their climate assembly, and hopefully it's something that we'll think about in our own citizens assemblies um, going forward. You know, but I I think that's going to be the really that kind of communication that I suppose Deirdre and and uh, Alice Mary and others who are, are going to have to do this afterwards is about well what did this decide what are the important things you know which are the bits that the politicians are actually going to drive forward and are going to try to to make sure are implemented so it's not entirely forgotten about okay listen we're on time now uh, and i'm going to uh, draw proceedings to an end i just want to thank deirdre uh, alice mary and you jane uh, just for, and of course, Guy earlier on, for uh, what is really only, I suppose, a, a preliminary discussion. I mean, there's lots more issues uh, that, that we could, and we'd like to come back to it at a later date as well. We, we will, i say, look forward to uh, being a um, uh, host for the event, uh, which is now being rescheduled at the Citizen Panel in uh, the first weekend in, the, in, in February, I think he said. We look forward to that. But it's a huge amount of debate, and to the extent that the IAA can contribute to this uh, with your support and with your involvement, uh, we're very much committed to doing that. So thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you, Alice Mary. And thank you, Deirdre. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you.